All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. This is Andrew Hall, and I am exceptionally happy to talk with Green Party candidate for President of the United States, Howie Hawkins. I chatted with Mr. Hawkins in 2019, which seems to be an eternity away, Howie. Yeah, it's been a long, in some ways it's been a long, you know, campaign. In other ways, it just flashed by. But when I start to think about all the things we did, like 47 green primaries, and then a mad scramble to get on a ballot, you know, it wasn't until mid-September we could really focus exclusively on getting our message out. So right. it's been a, quite, a, quite a journey. You know, since, since we talked, millions of people are out of work. Hundreds of thousands of people are dead from COVID-19. You know, sir, what, what is to be done? What is to be done in, in this mash that we're in, in this, in this series of disasters that we're in? Well, I think the state you just described shows that the two governing parties in this country are presiding over a failed state. I mean, just take COVID. All the Pacific Rim countries, all the European countries, many countries in the global south, just listen to public health advice. Test people, contact trace, isolate those exposed or infected, and that suppresses community spread of the virus so we can go back to work in the schools safely. Real simple. Trump is really a dummy. I mean, he, he couldn't see what was going on. He's a loser. COVID won, and he wants to move on. But Biden had the national stage since March, and he didn't, he could have convened the White House press corps for socially distanced news conferences like Andrew Cuomo did in, here in New York, get on cable news and say, we need test, trace, and isolate. Let's get going, point the direction, mobilize the people. He wants to provide leadership, and he didn't. He was basically hiding and letting Trump hang himself with his own words. Mm -hmm. But if you can improve a situation and you don't, you're complicit in the bad situation. And so that's number one. And then behind that immediate crisis is an economic crisis. And the government is not providing the relief people need or the protections they need for their jobs, their homes, their small businesses, their income. And then we got a climate crisis that just grinds away. Nothing's being done about it. And we can go into the details. You know, Trump calls climate change a hoax, but Biden acts as if it's a hoax. His climate plan, so-called, is pro-fossil fuels and pro-nuclear. And then we got, even before the COVID crisis, we got an inequality crisis where life expectancies in this country are in decline, particularly among the working class. Mm -hmm. For 45 years of stagnant wages, housing, health care, and college costs going through the roof, people are retiring without any savings if they can get there. And then some people, they call them deaths of despair. People's, uh, their expectations were not met in their lives. And so people turn to alcohol, drugs, suicides, as well as the kind of uh, lifestyle sicknesses, you know, diabetes, obesity. And, and then people want medical care, but they can't afford it. So they pay the utility bill or the rent, and then they get sick and sometimes die. And then finally, this is an issue that ought to be a top campaign issue, not being talked about. The United States is deploying new tactical and strategic nuclear weapons. It's destabilized the global balance of terror. The bullets and the atomic scientists as their doomsday clock, the closest they've ever had it to midnight. Not a word about it because both parties, both Trump and Biden, are committed to deploying these new nuclear weapons. Yeah. So we have peace initiatives. Cut the military budget. Get out of these endless wars. Pledge no first in, of no first use of nuclear weapons, and then go to the other nuclear powers and say, we're not a global military empire anymore. We're not a threat to you. We want complete and mutual nuclear disarmament. And go there with world public opinion. 122 nations agreed to a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, the text of it, three years ago. Last Monday, the 50th nation ratified it, which means it goes into effect for 50 nations. And the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that achievement three years ago. Nobody hardly in this country even knows that mm, yeah. because our corporate state media stenographers won't say anything that Trump and the not Trump says. And that's that's been the debate. Trump tweets 
The Democrats are outraged. The corporate media is outraged. It's all about Trump, not about the issues. So our response I, I, is to put forward a positive program. That, that's fantastic. I, I want to ask you a straightforward and blunt question. Are we living in here in the United States or in America in an oligarchical system? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's more than it's not even the one percent. It's the one tenth of one percent. They own so much of the productive assets of the country and their concentrated economic power translates into concentrated political power. You know, the major parties got to go to them for money. They don't get invested in unless they do what the oligarchs want. And then even if they try to do reforms, the oligarchs not only pay for campaigns, they pay for lobbyists and they finance government. You know, they're the ones that are the major investments in treasuries and bonds from local and uh, state governments. If they decide not to invest, the government can't move. Yeah. So they control the finances. So they, that power is not up for election, but it's there. So we do have an oligarchy, a plutocracy. A lot of people don't seem to understand the connection between this kind of wealth disparity and how it warps our politics. And it just seems like you can bang your head up against the wall, but a lot of Americans seem to have been brainwashed in extent by the politics, the Reagan tax cuts, uh, just flooding middle class people with money and getting the idea that the government is their enemy. And, and now that we have this wide disparity in money, there is a wide kind of polarization of our politics. Yeah, and a blame the victim mentality. So people that haven't done well in life because the opportunities weren't there, the good middle class, middle income, factory jobs were shipped overseas and so forth. They've been taught to blame themselves. And that's why, you know, they don't turn to other people to try to improve the situation. They too often turn to alcohol, drugs, eating too much, you know, getting sick. Yeah. And uh, that's those are the deaths of despair. So uh, I think, you know, the answer and that's why we need a, a party that represents working people and actually organizes them. You know, Democrats and Republicans are memberless parties. You tell the state which party's primary you want to vote in, but you don't have a local chapter of the Democrats or Republicans that go to meetings, talk about the issues, figure out what should be done about them. Today, it's we don't even have the civic organizations we used to have. So people sit online if they pay attention at all. And you have this nonprofit industrial complex. There's a liberal wing and there's a conservative wing, but they hire staff. Staff decides what the next move is. So you get moveon.org telling you what your next move is. And you didn't participate in that. And so it, it kind of dumbs us down. Whereas if we had a party with local chapters where people talk to each other, develop themselves and each other as thinkers and speakers and writers, you know, that'll make us smarter in dealing with this oligarchy. And uh, it also, when people feel empowered because they're participating, they stop being apathetic and they start being engaged. You know, the biggest group of voters on November 3rd will be those that didn't vote. Hmm. They're going to win the election again. And you talk to those people and people say, oh, they're apathetic. I think more of them are alienated and they feel powerless. And when you're powerless, it's painful to even pay attention to the news because you can't do anything about it or think you can't do anything about it. So you kind of tune out. And, uh, but in my experience, when you knock on the door and, and ask people what's going on, you know, what do you think? What are the issues? A lot of people pour their hearts out. You know, yeah. they got all kinds of issues and they're really angry at the two parties because they never see them. Yeah. And they don't think the leadership of the two parties knows them, knows what their problems are, has any idea what their life is like. So they they just opt out yeah. of uh, politics. Sir, I want to read you this definition, this Merriam-Webster definition of fascism. Um, it's a political philosophy movement, a regime such as the fascisti that exalts nation and often race above the individual and stands for a centralized autographic autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader, severe economic and social regimentation, and a forcible suppression of opposition. Sir, do you think that Donald J. Trump is a fascist? 
I think he's a wannabe fascist, a wannabe autocrat, but he didn't have a fascist movement. And he's too lazy and incompetent to organize one. So I don't think the threat is fascism. It's it's a right wing irrationalism, you know, the QAnon conspiracy and the cult of Trump. And, you know, yes, there are these right wing militias that are in the scheme of things, really not that powerful. They're pretty ragtag. They're going to, you know, shoot each other more than they, you know, if they ever faced the U.S. military, they'd be wiped out in a minute. They're just not a threat. This is not, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in arms and militias like Hitler had, like Mussolini had. Right. And you look at the uh, repression from the federal government. The worst thing they did was send federal agents into Portland, which was, you know, very authoritarian. But then they, uh, the Portland authorities and the Oregon authorities said, get the hell out. And Trump did. You know, a fascist would say, no, you get the hell out. We're taking over. And, you know, look at the, uh, re, you know, all the conspiracy trials we had in the late 60s in the COINTEL program. You know, there's this film out on the Chicago 7, but that wasn't the only conspiracy trial. And that was led by the Mitchell uh, Department of Justice. I mean, William Barr should be impeached in my mind for a lot of reasons, but he hasn't done that. Mm -hmm. So I think people are a little bit hysterical about Trump. Because his rhetoric is so off the charts. I mean, his yeah. racist, misogynistic, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric is so, in, you know, it's just extreme scapegoating. And people are rightly outraged by that. Definitely. But, you know, just look at, say, State Department or other agencies. They're hollowed out. He hasn't even filled the, the, the position. So he hasn't entrenched his autocracy even in the federal bureaucracy so i think the the bigger issue is not trump but trumpism yes this, this right-wing reactionary irrational movement but you know the optimistic side of that is they're the minority in this country they really are kind of the continuation of the old you know racist dixiecrat tendency in our politics that goes back throughout our history and demographically they're declining numerically they're declining and if the polls are right, I think they're right. If the vote is counted, they're going to get their butts kicked this election. That's what I'm hoping for. And I think a lot of people are hoping for that, that they just voted into oblivion for all intents and purposes. Yeah, I, I think they'll be around, but there'll be there'll be a, you know, a right wing opposition that isn't going to gain ground because they really don't have anything to offer. You know, the people, the issues we talked about at the top, mm -hmm. you know, they all they got to offer is. You know, a corporation moved your job overseas and they want to blame the Mexicans. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, you know I, I've heard you talk about ballot lines before and other videos and other interviews. I want you to explain what ballot lines are and why are they so important? Well, they enable you to get on a ballot and actually run a lot easier than if you have to petition as an independent. In most states, say run for Congress, you need thousands or tens of thousands of signatures. Compared to other countries, it's off the charts. You want to run as an independent for the House of Commons in England, it takes 10 signatures. Mm. You want to run as an independent for the Congress in India, the world's largest electoral democracy, it takes two signatures. Two signatures for parliament in, in New Zealand. It's 50 in Australia, 100 in Canada, except the rural ridings, those are their districts, it's 50 signatures. And here it's thousands or tens of thousands. So people ask, well, why don't the Greens run more down ballot candidates? It's hard as hell to get on the ballot. And when we do file our petitions, the Democrats challenge them. And then you have a whole process of, you know, documenting your signatures and like in Pennsylvania, where we got knocked off the ballot, the Democrats subjected to over 5,000 signatures. We spend a lot of money and a month of time documenting those are good signatures. Mm -hmm. And after the Democrats made us go through all that, they said, okay, we're dropping that objection. They had another technical objection about paperwork filing that should not have taken us off the ballot, but did. Yeah. Because basically we have the two governing parties administering our elections in this country, not an independent nonpartisan agency like the other countries. So every time we go to a board of election, an election commission or a court, it's a strictly partisan vote. Mm -hmm. 
The Democrats want us off the ballot. The Republicans want us on the ballot. And I think both of them overestimate our impact on their vote because most of our voters wouldn't vote for either of them if we weren't on the ballot. Yeah. We know from the 2016 exit polls that Jill Stein's voters, 61% of them would have stayed home if she was not on the ballot. So for the Democrats, they're worried about the Republicans. They got bigger issues. They got voter suppression, particularly of black voters, but likely Democratic voters in university towns and Latinos. And that's, there's almost 17 million people purged from the voter rolls since 2016. And then that's what makes it even close in a presidential race. But then we've had losers like Donald Trump and before him, George W. Bush, losing the popular vote and getting installed by the Electoral College. Yep. So y you want to correct that problem? And you're worried about the Greens, quote unquote, spoiling the election? You know, join with us in replacing the Electoral College with the national popular vote using ranked choice voting. That yes. solves the problem. Yep. You suppress the Green Party, that's as authoritarian as anything that, that Trump is doing. I mean, running for office is the fullest expression of the First Amendment, freedom of speech, petitioning the government for redress of grievances, freedom of the press, because we you know, got to get our word out in the press, freedom of religion, which really means freedom of thought. And they are suppressing parties, which is a form of voter suppression as well. I think that's really important, because I heard you say that before, is that suppressing a political party is voter suppression. Yeah. And, and I think that's really important for people to hear and, and for them to roll around in their minds. Yeah, and it's as authoritarian as denying people the right to vote. True enough. Um, so, you know, when, when the Democrats tell us how dangerous Trump is, you know, from our experience, the Democrats are dangerous. Right. I see that, or I feel that Biden gets into office. I am concerned that he's not going to do the reforms that he needs to do to take us out of this, this kind of spiral into losing more of our freedoms, going deeper into oligarchy. That's what I'm concerned about. Well, I think you're right. I mean, the one thing I think he'll do that Trump didn't is follow the public health advice and will handle the, you know, the COVID public health side of things. Um, but yeah, when it comes to our commitments to a global military empire, Biden's been, you know, a champion of that his whole political career, including being the principal Democrat that rallied Democrats behind Bush's invasion of Iraq. And he said he may raise the military budget. He said nothing about the deployment of these new nukes, except that he supports it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the Democrats stood up and gave a standing ovation with the Republicans to Juan Guaido in the gallery when Trump gave his last state of the union address. And, you know, so that tells me the Democrats are going to be behind uh, staging coups in other countries, yep. as they always have been. I mean, Obama, first year he was in office, they grabbed uh, President Zelaya of uh, Honduras in his pajamas and shipped him out of the country. I mean, mm -hmm. before that, we took uh, Aristide out of Haiti in his pajamas and flew him to Africa. That kind of thing isn't going to stop. And then on the economics, you know, all Biden says his Build Back Better program is trickle down economics as much as Trump's tax cuts for the rich are because it's mainly targeted tax cuts and subsidies to promote, you know, certain results. The problem is you give the rich more money and the demand isn't there. Instead of investing in new productive assets, they buy stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, and just rearrange the who owns the productive assets we already got. Right. So trickle down economics doesn't work. That has been what both parties do in contrast to what, what we're advocating. You know, what we did somewhat during the New Deal, did during World War II, and that is the government directly employs people to make the things or provide the services that we need. Mm -hmm. And that way, the public spending gets right to where it's needed yep. without this, you know, complicated theory of trickle-down economics, which doesn't work. It, it's clear that it doesn't work. I'm looking at your uh, site, uh, Holly Hawkins, um, and I'm looking at the Economic Bill of Rights, a platform 
for the Green Party, and there is a guaranteed minimum income above poverty. Is that universal basic income, sir? It's a little different. We're not giving a you know a thousand dollars to Jeff Bezos. We build it into the tax structure. So if your income is below the poverty line, uh, the government sends you checks to bring you up above the poverty line. Uh, it's called the negative income tax. Something Martin Luther King was demanding with the Poor People's Campaign. Something Nixon, you know, I mean, right wingers have proposed this. Milton Friedman, Nixon proposed something like that. The problem was their minimum income was still a poverty income. And we're saying it should be uh, bring you above the poverty line. And poverty line needs to be basically doubled to really account for the real cost of living. The poverty line we got is inherited from a it's three times a, a sort of emergency food budget in the late 50s, and they adopted it in the mid 60s. And food costs have not inflated as much as housing, health care, and other things that we didn't need back then, like broadband, but you need now, you know, like to apply for a job. You know, there are a lot of, you know, like I know I worked at UPS. You don't go over to UPS and fill out paper, you got to get online. Yeah. And if, so, yeah, the poverty line needs to be raised so it's, it reflects today's cost of living. But in any case, so we've costed that out. At the current poverty line, it's about 200 billion a year. At the double poverty line, it's about 400 billion a year. In contrast, you know, Andrew Yang's thousand dollars a month for everybody was three and a half trillion. And you're giving money to people that don't need it, like, you know, Bezos and, and Gates and, you know, Warren Buffett and Donald Trump. Although, I don't know, Donald Trump may need it. He may. <laughs> That's he right. Money. He may net out the low zero. <laughs> Good point, sir. Good point. Um, tell me the difference between the Green Party's Green New Deal and Joe Biden's Green New Deal. Well, he doesn't have one. <laughs> we made that clear in the first debate if anybody wasn't paying attention. I mean, what happened was I was the first candidate to campaign on a Green New Deal in this country in 2010, running for governor of New York. And it became the Signature policy of the Green Party. Jill Stein, our presidential candidate in 2012 and 2016, the theme of her campaign was the Green New Deal for America. And at the end of the midterms, the Sunrise Movement with uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in tow uh, sat in Pelosi's office demanding a select committee on a Green New Deal, which was great. And the corporate media loved that. And so the Green New Deal, you know, went viral. And Pelosi wasn't having a select committee that could put legislation on the floor. So AOC and Ed Markey, the senator, came back with a non-binding resolution for a Green New Deal, just trying to get a sense of Congress. But that non-binding Green New Deal took the slogan and diluted the most important content. They eliminated the ban on fracking and new fossil fuel infrastructure, which is the frontline demand of a climate action program. If we build out that infrastructure of particularly frack gas in the pipelines and the power plants, we're going to be burning gas and, and emitting carbon emissions for decades. I think that's an important point to, to once again reemphasize is that if we build this new infrastructure around fossil fuels, we are married to that infrastructure for decades down the line. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, you could just shut it down, but there's such powerful interest that invested all that money and they want to get the payback. So... Yeah, it just makes it a lot harder. Uh, instead of phasing out nuclear power, well, the resolution didn't say pro-nuclear power, but now Biden is pro-nuclear power. The Democratic Party, for the first time in 50 years in their platform, is pro-nuclear power. And this is after the Obama and Biden administration gave loan guarantees to start six new nuclear power plants. First time since the 70s. And four of those six are belly up due to cost overruns and construction delays. Mm -hmm. And the only two they're still building in Vogel, Georgia, are being built and money being thrown down that waste hole because Brian Kemp, who was Secretary of State, suppressed the black vote, stole the election from Stacey Abrams, became governor. And his he's a creature of Georgia Power and the Southern Company that are building that, those nukes. So the other thing is, at this point, nuclear power is two to three times more costly than most forms of solar and wind. So, you know, that's just a ridiculous, you know, just from the economic standpoint. So they, they dropped the ban on fracking new fossil fuel infrastructure, the phase out of nuclear power, 
the cuts in military spending to redirect resources, you know, engineers and plant and equipment to building uh, carbon free production systems. And then they extended the deadline from 2030 to 2050. And then Pelosi never let him vote on it. She called it, quote, the green dream or whatever, end quote. And McConnell had them all vote in the Senate because half the Democrats are running for president and he wanted to get them on the record so they could, you know, bash him for supporting the Green New Deal. So Schumer and Markey said, this is a trick. We're voting president. So all the Democrats voted president, except the four that voted with the Republicans no on the watered down Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the Biden plan and coming out of the Sanders Biden unity working group on climate, no mention of the Green New Deal, no real plan. I mean, Biden got everything he wanted. He got uh, fossil fuels. It's you got to read between the lines of what they produce because it went right into the Democratic platform. They call for carbon capture and sequestration, which is uh, covering up the fact that they plan to frack the hell out of the country for oil and gas yep. and burn gas and the carbon capture and sequestration won't happen because it's not economical. It, yep, it, it prices won't. gas out of the market. And then they want to build 50,000 electric vehicle stations. That's not bad, but it's just a fraction of what we need in the transportation sector. We got to move to rails, you know, light rails in the cities, high speed trains between the cities, freight rails that are electrified. We need to rebuild the whole rail system for, you know, clean transportation. And then they they say, we're going to build or we're going to retrofit five million buildings in the next four years for energy efficiency and clean energy. Well, great. There are 120 million buildings in the country. At that pace, it'll take 150 years to clean up the building sector. Yeah. So it's just not a serious program. That's why I say, you know, Democrats act as if climate change is a hoax. So our plan is to get to 100% clean energy and zero negative emissions by 2030. Mm -hmm. We rely heavily, we call it an eco-socialist Green New Deal budget. We have uh, a budget on our website that shows our homework. You can see how we derive what we think it'll cost, how many jobs it will create, 38 million jobs. And uh, we rely heavily on public enterprise and planning in the energy, transportation, and manufacturing sectors because I it's not just transforming how we produce electric power, which is about 27% of the carbon footprint. We got to transform transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, and buildings. And that means new kinds of production. So electric arc furnaces instead of coke ovens to produce steel and a different kind of cement than Portland cement, which uses calcium carbonate to harden the cement. The carbonate evaporates. That's 5% of the world's carbon footprint right there. I had no idea about that until you just said that. That a certain that this concrete that we're using actually contributes to global warming. Yeah, but they're technologies. We got to go through all the way we produce things and eliminate the carbon emissions in producing goods and services. Yeah, not just where we get the electric power from. No, very good point. So before we start wrapping it up, how do we make police departments? less racist, less corrupt, less likely to kill everyday citizens in the streets. We got to bring them under community control so they serve and protect the people, not themselves, where they police themselves and get away with their crimes and the power structure behind them. You know, it's democratic machines in the cities mm -hmm. that set up these departments to harass downscale people, particularly black people, and keep them out of upscale communities. And they harass them with low level offenses, even non-criminal behavior. And that's most of what they do. And they don't solve the serious crimes, the violent crimes of, you know, assault and homicide and rape or the serious property crimes like carjacking and home burglaries. They only clear about 25% of those cases with arrests. So 75% Whoever did it never gets, you know, charged or arrested. And then I think the worst statistic is 60% of the victims of those serious crimes never report them to the police. Because hmm. a lot of people are afraid if I was at the scene of the crime, I may say I'm a victim, but the police may arrest me. 
Oh, yeah. So, you know, there's not a trust there. So when we say community control, we're talking about either elected police commissions or I like this idea better, selected by lot like juries. Yep. You get the politics out of the selection because the police unions and the real estate industry, you know, they'll have a big influence on those elections. <clears throat> so those commissions would have the power to hire and fire the police chief, to rid the departments of the racists and the sadists, to oversee policies and budgets, and to independently investigate and discipline misconduct. Mm. And so you got to take it out of the police departments because otherwise they're going to cover up their own problems and continue to work for the people that set them up to do what they do. The idea that institutions can police themselves, whether it's Wall Street, whether it's police, it's absurd and pernicious. It erodes public trust and it erodes faith in the system itself. Yeah, I mean, democracy is about our government agencies working for the people, not working for themselves. I mean, you sometimes wonder people run for government offices saying the government is the problem. You know, well, if it is, what do you what? Why do you want to get in there? It's uh, it's it's an amazing uh, that that narrative has taken such hold in this country. You know, it, you know, Reagan was the one who said uh, the, the scariest words are we're from the government. We're here to help. And uh, then Clinton said, you know, the problem now is government is the problem, not the solution. Hmm. I mean, we've been getting it from both parties since. I would say, you know, the post Watergate period, you know, Definitely. Carter administration and then Reagan, you know, took it to another level and Clinton took it to another level. Howie Hawkins, Green Party candidate for president of the United States. Before you go, is there a question you wanted me to ask you, but I didn't? Was there a topic you wanted to speak on, but we didn't get to? We're not talking about plugs or where people can find you online, but was there a subject you wanted to touch on? Well, I think we covered the key issues. You didn't ask the question I always get asked is, why the hell am I spoiling on the election? Sir, because I'm not a fool and I don't ask questions that, that are foolish. But you can go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> but I know it's on people's minds because, you know, they do want to come out of there. And my answer is it's the Democrats that have spoiled the election by failing to go after the Electoral College and substitute that for, with a national popular vote for ranked choice voting. And if we're not out here raising that issue, it won't get raised. And I believe it's an idea whose time has come. We got it in 23 cities and counties. It's going to be used for the presidential election in Maine. And they use it for all their state elections now. And it's on a ballot in Massachusetts and Alaska in this election. I'm so, in Massachusetts, as you can probably tell by the way I butchered the language. I, I voted for you for president of the United States. I voted for ranked choice voting also. Um, I. And I don't see why everyone doesn't, at least in Massachusetts, um, when you have those kind of choices available to you on the ballot. Yeah. Well, I think in the next period, that's something we really got to push across the country at the local level, the state level, and then in the federal level is where we, there's a bill in Congress to elect members of Congress from multi-member districts using ranked choice voting. Jamie Raskin has introduced it and that would create proportional representation. So, the Green Party would not just be running in elections. We'd actually have people in Congress. Um, and, and it's that, important to note that there are Green Party people in local positions. Uh, I remember you saying that there was like maybe 150. Yeah, it's over 100. I don't know what the exact number is right now. We've elected over 1,200 over the years. And what I'm saying is the Greens and the independent left, the left, should be electing thousands in the next few years to local office and from there to state ledge in Congress. You know, the left has got to stop counting on the Democratic Party because, you know, they've never delivered on the issues like Medicare for all. You know, the establishment closes ranks against the progressives in the party. I mean, we saw that with Bernie Sanders runs. I think the lesson of Bernie Sanders is run as a damn independent. You'll get elected. <laughs> His whole career was he ran independent, he got elected. He ran as a Democrat. And the establishment just closed the door. That's a very nice way of putting it. That's a very polite way of putting it. Sir, where can people find you online? Uh, HowieHawkins.us is our website. 
And from there, they can find the links to social media. They can find out more about our policy positions and how they can get involved in the campaign. Howie Hawkins, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I wish you the best on Election Day, and I wish you the best in general anyway. You're fighting the good fight, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And I'm going to hit the end broadcast.